Today on SUNUP, it's go time at the Tulsa State Fair. We're checking out the 4-H and FFA exhibits and getting up to speed on all things agriculture. Plus, talking fertilizer application as more wheat is planted across Oklahoma and learning all about jack-o'-lanterns just in time for Halloween. SUNUP starts right now. everyone and welcome to SUNUP. I'm Lyndall Stout. We're on the road this week at the Tulsa State Fair. We'll have much more from here at the fairgrounds a little bit later in the show. But first we caught up with Dr. Brian Arnell to talk about fertilizer for both dual purpose and grain only wheat fields. So if we look at the, the current status of, of Oklahoma wheat crop, nutrient management, we got a couple things happening. One, we've, we've had some wonderful rains in spots. So that means our early wheat, even some of our wheat that was dusted in is up. Uh, like this field we're in right now, it's really starting to go and starting to kick off, which is good. We have good potential. Uh, on this early wheat that is in the ground, of course, for grazing or dual purpose. That's why it's in pre, uh, prior to October. We want to make sure we have 30 to 50 pounds. I like the number of 50 because it's 30 pounds per thousand, uh, thousand pounds of forage. So we want, we want about 50 pounds of nitrogen down for our forage production. Now, if we think about it, a lot of our ground due to, you know, crop losses in the previous years might have a fair amount of residual. So I don't really want to put too much into this soil, too much into this forage, because while we've got a nice stand right now, so here in Stillwater, we got a beautiful stand of wheat from that early sown, but we're getting dry again. In fact, there's not much moisture below the top three or four inches. So I don't want too much down, right? We just want enough to get the crop up and going and get moving. Once we have more soil moisture, we get some more rain, then we can feel more comfortable in investing more in this crop. For our, our grain only that's gonna be starting to drop, you know, the first week of October through October, uh, I'm still on the bandwagon of I don't really want a lot of nitrogen up front. I'm good with the inferral fertilizer, the 1846O, the 1152O, 1034, those nitrogen and phosphorus. I like the phosphorus in furrow. The nitrogen's not giving me a whole lot of value. So it's all about the phosphorus in our lower pH soils, our high pH soils and low phosphorus. Make sure we got a good root establishment, get up and going. Uh, you guys heard me talk on sun up time in and time out that waiting on nitrogen for our grain only has a lot of value because we're establishing a better root. We're exploring the soil more, kind of keeping the plant a little more compact as it goes through winter. Of course, time in and time out, I'm going to tell you, use an enriched strip. You guys can use uh, spreaders, uh, ATVs, all kinds of ways to put out 30 to 50 pounds of nitrogen in a strip. If you cannot see the strip, the field is not deficient on nitrogen and you don't have to rush. So let the field do the talking. Let us use that enriched strip to guide when we need it. And then you can use OSU's uh, sensor-based nitrogen rate calculator for a free recommendation on how much to apply when you see that strip show up. It is the time of year where we're extremely busy, a lot of questions and a lot of decisions. Great opportunity to utilize that county extension office. Go there, visit with those folks in that office. Uh, they have the contacts. They are the front door to uh, Oklahoma State University. Welcome to this first fall edition of the Mesonet Weather Report. I'm Wes Lee. Fall season has arrived, but the seasons don't appear to have paid any attention to the calendar. Summer heat still wants to persist, and that is drying up our precious soil moisture. As of Wednesday afternoon, high temperatures had reached the 90s almost statewide. 
This was much the same for earlier in the week and expected to remain the same into the weekend. Looking back into the year at high temperatures, we can see how the temperatures have changed due to the seasons. For the winter months, the state saw two to three degrees higher than normal high temperatures. Mesonet uses the climatological seasons, which change every three months. For spring, March, April, and May, it depended upon where you live, but for the most part it was normal in the east or cooler than normal in the west. The climatological summer that ended August 31st was again split depending upon where you live. Very warm in the southwest, slightly warmer than normal in the east, and cooler than normal in the northwest. September statewide average has been warmer than normal on most days. Forecasters are not predicting a change in the heat for at least the next two weeks, as is seen with all the red colors on this forecast map. Next, Gary's drought map shows improvement in one part of the state. Thanks, Wes, and good morning, everyone. Well, it was an interesting few weeks there with our annual uh, State Fair cold front and rainfall. Who came out ahead and who came out behind? Let's take a look at the newest drought monitor and see where we are. Well, not a lot of improvement across the state. Uh, you know, just as it's been happening, a lot of that rain fell in that streak from northwest Oklahoma down through uh, southeast Oklahoma where the drought's not quite as bad or it's not there at all. However, we did see some improvement in that far southeast corner where generally six to nine inches of rain fell. So really good improvements down in that area. Not so much across the west of the state. In fact, we saw more drought develop, that extreme drought, the red in far southwest Oklahoma, a little bit more down in south central Oklahoma. So same thing we've said a lot uh, over the last few months, last few years in fact. We just need more rainfall. And sure enough, how it keeps happening, the Mesonet consecutive days with less than a quarter inch of rainfall in a single day map, that dry streak is starting to uh, accelerate once again. Now we're about two weeks into it. Um, it looks like we might get a little bit longer into it, hopefully some rain next week. But this is how these little drought episodes start. They get a little bit of rain, a lot longer period without rainfall. Just take a look at the rainfall departures from normal for the last 60 days and we can see a lot of heavy rain up in far northwest Oklahoma, a lot of heavy rain in east central down through southeast Oklahoma. Again, most areas where there's not a lot of drought. And we have those large areas across the southwestern third of the state, also up in north central Oklahoma and the western panhandle with growing deficits once again. Well, we're due for some good news. So the monthly outlook from the Climate Prediction Center for October does see above uh, normal rainfall, at least increased odds for above normal rainfall for the month of October. So that would definitely be good news. This is a little bit dated and it came out last week, but hopefully this still comes, uh, comes through for us. And then if we look for the October through December period, and uh, we are getting into the first bit of winter here, we do see again increased odds of above normal precipitation for nearly the entire state just missing that far northeastern corner. So a lot's riding on this, uh, what's expected to be a strong El Nino, so we'll keep an eye on that. That's it for this time. We'll see you next time on the Mesonet Weather Report. It's time to check in on the livestock markets with our livestock marketing specialist, Dr. Daryl Pill. And Daryl, the USDA just released their cattle on feed report. So what did it tell us? The September cattle on feed report showed that uh, placements in August were down 5%. Uh, marketings were down 6%, so 94% of last year, and that gave us a, a September 1 on-feed total of 98% of a year ago, so down 2% year over year. So were there any surprises? Well, the report itself wasn't really a surprise, pretty well anticipated, uh, mostly in line with expectations. Uh, you know, one of the things that does surprise me a little bit, though, with each month is, is the fact that we're, we are pulling these feedlot inventories down, but we're doing it at a very slow pace. We've had feedlot inventories down every month for the last 12 months, and yet we're still only down 2% on a year-over-year -year basis. So it's a slow process, but we are slowly pulling uh, the total inventories down. So, so in regards to that inventory, are there still any, any heifers out in the feedlots? You know, the, the heifers is, is the biggest reason the feedlot inventories have stayed high. So uh, the last data we had on the heifers on feed was in July, quarterly data, uh, and we still had right at 40% of all the feedlot inventories were 
were heifers at that time, and that was the highest level since a, a, in 2001. So uh, next month, October's cattle on feed report will give us another quarterly read on that. I suspect that we'll see some decrease in the heifers on feed, but that too has been a very slow process. So is heifer slaughter still pretty high? It has been. Um, you know, we now it has uh, decreased faster a little bit since uh, really it's in the second half of the year since the Fourth of July. But uh, you know, it's it's down only about 1.1 percent for the year to date. It was only down about a half a percent in the first half of the year, uh, and that compares to steer slaughter, which is down right at five percent for the year. So the heifer slaughter again is coming down, but it's coming down quite slowly. So what about heifer retention? Well, based on all of that. Uh, and, you know, everything we get uh, at this point in time would suggest that we're not really moving very aggressively towards heifer retention. Uh, and in fact, in the meetings I've done talking to producers, I think they're moving very cautiously. So it remains to be seen where we'll be on January 1, but uh, it looks like we're not necessarily uh, making a, a really aggressive effort to retain heifers at this point in time. And what's really the impact of prices going to be with all that? Well, the longer we delay this, you know, cattle numbers are tight. Uh, the herd is smaller than it has been for since 1962. Uh, and so the longer we push off rebuilding, then the longer we're going to be in these tight supplies and the longer we're going to have uh, record high prices. All righty. Thanks, Daryl. Dr. Daryl Peel, Livestock Marketing Specialist here at Oklahoma State University. Good morning, Oklahoma, and welcome to Cow-Calf Corner. I'm Mark Johnson, and this week's topic is beef quality assurance. Last week, we talked about OQBN sales and how a necessary part of that is produce, for producers to be BQA certified in order to get those calves into beef quality network sales in Oklahoma. And so we followed up this week on the topic of beef quality assurance, and we're fortunate to be joined today by Dr. Barry Whitworth. He is the coordinator of the BQA program in Oklahoma. And we'll kind of go through this, Barry, and just talk about what is BQA? Well, Beef Quality Assurance is just really a program that is designed to help producers uh, using uh, science-based production practices to assure that we're taking care of those cows, cattle well-being, beef quality, and safety. That's in a nutshell what it is all about. And th this idea has been around for a while. We've been doing certification trainings for a while. What is the long-term con consequence of more of us in this industry being BQA certified? Well, hopefully, I think one of the bottom line things is, is that consumers can rest assured that we're producing a quality product it's wholesome and it's safe, and that those cattle are being treated well. Great. And in a BQA training, what are the areas we actually cover? There are several areas in beef quality assurance that are covered. There's herd health, there's cattle handling, there's safety, um, just a variety of topics that are covered in, if you go online or wherever you go to get your training, that are gonna be covered in those training modules. And speaking of getting trained, Barry, if, if I decide I want to get certified today, how do I go about doing that? We have two, two methods that you can get certified. One is you can go to bqa.org and you can do the online training. Uh, the other is in-person trainings. And for the most part, we like those trainings to be conducted by our, our county agriculture educators. So each county has an agriculture educator and they will be certified and they can put on in in-person trainings for those people. So if someone's out there in the state, they can go online or reach out to their county office to see when an in-person training may be taking place? Yes, and they, and they occur at a variety of times across the state. So. And I know we'll include your contact information with a segment like we did in the newsletter, but producers could also reach out to you if they wanted more information on how to become certified. Sure they can, yeah, they can. Uh, Call me at my office, it's 580-332-7011, you know, or they can get me at barry.whitworth at okstate.edu. Be happy to assist them in any way that I can. And once we get certified, are we certified forever or do we need to get recertified? No, 
your, your certification lasts three years and then you're going to have to be recertified. Uh, currently, uh, there are modules that you can take uh, and one of them that's available right now is biosecurity uh, and there'll be other ones online that you can take and you can get the three credits that you're going to need to get recertified. Not all of those are up yet, but they are being worked on at the BQA.org. Or you can just go back through a, a regular training session like you did before and get recertified. Okay. Well, Dr. Whitworth, I appreciate you joining us today. And as always, we appreciate all of you joining us on Cow Calf Corner this week. Today, I thought I'd share a little bit of info about jack-o'-lanterns. Along with trick-or-treaters and candy, it would be hard to imagine Halloween without jack-o'-lanterns. However, both the holiday and the lantern were heavily influenced by Irish immigrants. Early Northern European Celtic cultures had traditions of using fruits and vegetables to represent human faces, though their purposes at that time is unknown. These traditions would merge with pagan harvest celebrations to form the holiday known as Samhain, which would have been the equivalent of New Year's Day and was celebrated on November 1st. Samhain Eve was celebrated on October 31st and would have been what we now consider Halloween. It was on this day that spirits were thought to move among the living as they passed into the afterlife. The Celts would build bonfires, dress up in costumes, and carve scary faces into root vegetables, such as turnips, to help protect themselves from the spirits. Eventually, these vegetables would later serve as lanterns, as metal lanterns would have been expensive and out of reach to many. Carving faces and designs into the hollowed out turnips would allow light to pass through while protecting the candle or ember inside. The name jack-o'-lantern may have originated from an 18th century Irish folktale about a man named Stingy Jack who enjoyed drinking and mischief. He would eventually be doomed to forever walk the earth with only a turnip lantern to light his way. This would inspire the nickname Jack of the Lantern or jack-o'-lantern. When Irish immigrants arrived in the United States in the 19th and early 20th century, they brought these traditions, folk tales, and holidays with them. They would also find a winter squash that was much larger and easier to carve, the pumpkin. So just a little bit of information about jack-o'-lanterns. Happy spooky season. For more information, please visit sunup.okstate.edu or food.okstate.edu. And just a quick reminder about the upcoming 2023 Native Pecan Field Day. This event will be on October 12th at Leon Bailey's Pecan Farm in Payton, Oklahoma. Topics will include establishing a native grove, equipment needed for tree cleanup, grazing and forage, and much, much more. Now, this field day is free, but the registration deadline is October 10th, so don't delay. For more information about this event, just go to sunup.okstate.edu. So what's going on with crop prices? Well, we have our crop marketing specialist, Dr. Kim Anderson, to help us walk through it. So Kim, what is going on with prices? Well, let's start with wheat prices. They've been worming their way down since, oh, the last two or three weeks. They're down to around to $6.40, $6.45. Lower in uh, Southern Oklahoma, say around $6.15. So we've seen wheat prices inching their way lower, and I'm concerned that they, I believe, broke in a support level, and they may go a little farther down. Uh, you're looking at corn prices sideways. Uh, forward contract or harvested corn right now, somewhere around $4.70. It's been in that area for the last couple of weeks. The soybeans, we took oh, 80 to 90 cents off the beans over the last three or four weeks. I think they've stabled down there. We gained around five cents over the last week, down around uh, 12, uh, 12 dollars and 30 cents now. A cotton, cotton like wheat's going down, cotton's inching, inching its way back north. It's up to around 88 cents on the futures contract. That'd be about 85 for Oklahoma. And you got the value of the dollar. Of course, that's the impact in both corn and beans and cotton. Uh, bean and corn prices, mostly gonna watch what the harvest is gonna be in the U.S. and the same with cotton. And cotton, as one analyst said, 
this is the most uncertain year we've had in cotton production. So that's what's going to impact prices there. So what's causing all this fluctuation? Well, if you're uh, looking at uh, what's going in the wheat market, I think probably watching the Southern Hemisphere, mainly what's going on in Australia. They planted, had good planting conditions, then the, the weather turned dry. They've been losing production, so they're watching that relatively co close. Also, what's going on in Argentina. Russia's always in the picture. President Putin's messing with prices. The market's concerned that he's going to put a minimum price for exporting Russian wheat, but Russia's got a massive amount of wheat to export. So there's a little bit of uncertainty there. And then you've got the value of the dollar going higher. It's up to about 108 now. So how are the summer crops harvest progressing? Well, if you're looking at uh, harvesting summer crops, uh, oh, about 20% of the corn's in the bin, 17% of beans and cotton around 16%. Let's shift on to 2024 wheat harvest. Um, as we can see, there's wheat coming up already. So how much percentage, give or take, is actually in the ground? Well, midweek, uh, midweek is about 17%. Oklahoma crop uh, wheat plantings is about 18%. So what are forward contract prices for 2024 wheat? Well, again, let's go to uh, Pond Creek somewhere around six dollars and thirty cents up to six forty five six thirty in southern oklahoma six forty five in northern oklahoma all righty thanks kim dr cam anderson grain marketing specialist here at oklahoma state university if you have old pesticides around the farm to get rid of there's a way to do so safely and at little to no cost osu extension and the department of agriculture are organizing three unwanted pesticide disposal days October 17th in Walters, the 18th in Buffalo, and again on the 19th in Dewey. You can bring up to 2,000 pounds to the drop-off sites for proper disposal at no charge. There is a fee for more than 2,000 pounds. Farmers, ranchers, commercial, and non-commercial applicators are welcome. Dealers should register in advance due to the expected large quantities. Since 2006, 1.2 million pounds of pesticides have been properly disposed of in Oklahoma, keeping the chemicals out of rivers, streams, landfills, and illegal dumps. To pre-register and find tips on safe transport, go to sunup.okstate.edu. There is still time left for you to register for the upcoming Rural Economic Outlook Conference coming up on October 11th in Stillwater. Topics include discussion on the challenges that ag producers face, the farm bill, and the Russia-Ukraine war's impact on commodities and the supply chain. Registration is $50 now and $75 after October 4th and also includes your meals. Go to our website sunup.okstate.edu for a link to sign up. Finally today, we're taking you behind the scenes at the Tulsa State Fair and having a greater understanding why the hundreds of projects entered here, including this one, are rooted in agriculture. We bring all of the exhibits from all of the counties that participate in the Tulsa State Fair. They're entered, they're judged, and then we begin the display of all of those exhibits. Uh, so lots of volunteers, lots of educators working together to um, show off all of the things that the kids have, have made and have done over the past year. All of the exhibits are wonderful. Um, there's everything from sewing and foods and nutrition to rocketry and science and technology. So there's lots of things for people to come and look at and enjoy while they're here. It is absolutely awesome, yes. It's an exciting time and they do such a good job with their projects. And I look at some of the, the drawings as far as like the, the soil profiles and the life, plant life cycles. It's just incredible the jobs that they are doing on their projects eight different areas and then there's obviously over 300 occupations that students can go into. And so their projects help lead them down a path, help them explore what their interests are and come up with what it is they want to do in their lives. For the, the people visiting the fair to come in and see what is going on in this world, that's where the fair actually started. Fairs began literally hundreds of years ago so that farmers and ranchers could show what it is they do, show their products, and it's morphed into so much more than that. But this is the heart of the fair, coming in and seeing the, the agricultural and the projects the students have done, 
So it's an important part, and I hope that everybody does come into the FFA and 4-H building and see what the, the students are doing. With 4-H, it's life skill development. Kids learn all of the different um, you know, responsibilities of the project. They are able to learn organizational skills, time management skills, how to use a sewing machine, or how to um, build a rocket, and why does this rocket work? There's a curriculum that goes with the different projects. It's not just, oh, I want to make a rocket, and you know, let's Google it. They um, develop goals that they want to set for themselves, and then these projects are a part of that learning process. And so those life skills are so, so important, and they're able to learn those different things through their 4-H project work. That'll do it for our show this week. Remember, you can see us anytime at sunup.okstate.edu and also follow us on YouTube and social media. From the Tulsa State Fair, I'm Lyndall Stout. Have a great week, everyone, and remember Oklahoma agriculture starts at sunup. <laughs>